I thank God for today. I thank God for that it's Pentecost Sunday and we're here together in God's house in one accord with one purpose and that's to lift him up and make his name great. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. So, Nehemiah 12, we're coming to the end. Oh, coming to the end, but that recap video was so good. Can we give Brother Nathan a hand and recognize his work in putting those recap videos together? Wonderful gift, and it's been a blessing to us because we can refresh and recap what we've learned so far over the many weeks that we've been studying. So, as I closed off um, last time, um, the children of Israel had selected out of themselves one out of ten people to go and live in Jerusalem and it's described as being the holy city. It's called the city that is set apart for God and for his purposes. So that designation, the holy city, was fulfilled by populating uh, um, the city with members of the new true Israel who would defend it and hopefully maintain its purity as I was on the, speaking on the clip there it spoke about the responsibilities of those who had been chosen and who had taken up the challenge of going to live within the city walls the next task um, that was in hand was to establish God appointed leaders of worship whose genealogies demonstrate that they were of those appointed by God, maintaining the holiness of worship. And that's kind of what we're covering today, early in the chapter of Nehemiah 12. And as we go on through the chapter, as Phil just read, uh, verses 27 to 47 describe a celebration of gladness and thanksgiving for the completion of the wall and gates which made the city possible as being established as holy and also the re-establishment of the system of tithes that ensured the maintenance of Yahweh's chosen appointees. So today is the day when we speak about the celebration of gladness and thanksgiving. But I'm hoping that we're not just going to speak about the celebration of gladness and thanksgiving. I wonder if we've got some worshippers in the house. Yeah. yeah. So, I'm going to try not to get too bogged down into the, the nuts and bolts, but there's going to be some time for some praise. So, be on guard. Worship leaders, be on guard. Keep your mics close. <laughs> Musicians, you might need to come up, baby. Let's see. So, chapter 12 kicks off, and it says, These are the priests and Levites who came up with Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua. So, immediately, it's taking us back to personages and events that uh, you'll find in the book of Ezra. So there's a going back in time, a recall of the priests that came with Zerubbabel into Jerusalem who rebuilt the temple. So Zerubbabel, in the time of the book of Ezra, he was um, a governor, he was appointed as a governor, but he's actually part of the Davidic lineage, which means that he was descended from King David, and had the kingdom um, continued, and had the Jews not gone into exile, there's a very good chance that um, Zerubbabel, well, he would have been part of the royal family. He may even have been king. So that's important. So he comes from that Davidic royal lineage and is um, mentioned, I believe, in the lineage of Jesus. So we've got that Davidic royal line that comes through Zerubbabel. And it says, and Yeshua. Yeshua comes up time and time again. Whenever Zerubbabel is mentioned, Yeshua was the high priest at the time. And as high priest, he had to be descended from Aaron. So in those two personages, we see the king or the descendant of the king, the continuation of David's bloodline. And as we know, God promised to David that his kingdom would be established forever. And that is fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. But we also see in the scripture, Psalms uh, 110 and elsewhere, 
it says that God has sworn and will not relent that Jesus is speaking about will be a high priest forever. So Yeshua, this high priest that we're talking about here, again reflects back and forth to that eternal priesthood that would be fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So even though Jesus is not here and not mentioned directly, there are references to him. So looking back to what had gone before and also looking forward to what was to come. This is prophetic um, kind of designation of the fact that we're on the right track here, basically. That God has continued, God has kept his people, he's kept his infrastructure in terms of these designated people who will bring forth the Messiah. So these people are in God's plan. There's a continuation of God's plan. Now if you read through the book of Ezra, we'll see that Zerubbabel um, and his contemporaries were successful in building the temple. Um, however, they were prevented, they started building the wall, but they were prevented from finishing by their adversaries. So they were successful in building the temple, but the wall wasn't finished. So sometimes God doesn't allow us to achieve everything that we want to do in the time that we have. Sometimes God gives us dreams and visions that are bigger than we are able to accomplish. But sometimes he allows us to set the foundations in place. Just like David. David wanted to build the temple. God said no. But he allowed him to make the preparations for his son to come forward and to finish the work that he started. So the mentioning of Zerubbabel and Jeshua speaks to those who may have started or initiated the work. But God is fulfilling it through the ministry of Nehemiah and his generation. So it's important for us not to get too disgruntled about what we can't do in our short lifespans. But what is, all, what is important is that we lay foundations, that we speak to our younger, maybe our children or our young people and place in them the vision that we have so that they can pick it up and run with it when we are gone. So don't feel like a failure because you can't do everything but lay the foundations. Also, as we see in those first few verses, it's recognizing those people, those pioneers, those priests and Levites that came into Jerusalem in Zerubbabel's time. And it goes on to speak about those who come after that, come after Joshua as well. I'm not going to call all the names, but you can read them for yourselves. So God recognizes those people who are pioneers. He doesn't forget them. He doesn't forget our labor. He doesn't forget those things that we have done. We might forget, but God doesn't forget. And what this displays is God's faithfulness. His faithfulness is displayed, displayed through these generations, bearing in mind they've been through exile. They've been cut off. If you um, read at the end of Kings and Chronicles, you'll see what happened to the king. He, his eyes were put out after his sons were killed in front of him and he was led away into captivity. And it looked as if everything had finished and that it was over and it was done with. And Israel or Judah were done as a nation. It looked like it was all over. But even when it looks like things are over, God has the ability to restore to bring back, to, to, to cause that which is dead to flourish again. So this is important. When we, we read through these names, we celebrate the fact that God's promises are yes, and in Christ they find their amen. Christ was the fulfillment of those promises. Even though they went through exile, they went through persecution, God was faithful to his word and he was preserved through these names of men and families represented in these verses. So these men, they, they enlisted, they were brought up, many of them in a time of exile and they lived through this rebuild period but they, they lived in some cases away from Jerusalem and yet their 
priestly mantle was not discarded. God didn't revoke their calling. God has a way of preserving us. Even sometimes when we're not even in the right place or at the right time. When God speaks to us and when he puts his hand on us. Even though we might be far away, God has a way of bringing us back. Amen? I don't know if any of you can testify to that, that God brought you back. He had his hand on your life and even though you might have even tried yourself to run away from him, God's got a way of drawing his people back to him. His mark is on your life. And note as well, it speaks about the fact that the reason why we have these records of names is that even though Israel didn't have their own king, in verse 22, it says that the Levites were in other's houses, so too were the priests in the reign of Darius the Persian. I think I might have gone one verse too far. But what it speaks of is that the fact that, if you read through the chronicles, it, the chroniclers were very often appointed by the king. But even though they were in exile, Darius the Persian, he was the foreign king. He was the king of Persia. He took it upon himself to keep note of these priests that went into Jerusalem during the time of Zerubbabel. So God sometimes provides for us in the place where we don't expect provision. Even though they didn't have their own king upon the throne to commission their own chronicles, God used Darius, a foreign king. He moved his heart more than once to be able to allow Zerubbabel and his generation to do God's work. You know, God can move upon the hearts of people you don't believe so that you can do his work. Amen. The word says that God has the heart of the king in his hand like a river. He can turn it wherever he chooses. So even though we might go through times of chastening, even though we might go through times where it feels like we are far away from God in our walk with him, God may chasten us. We might even take ourselves away for a time. But God is faithful to restore. I think God is just waiting for you to come back or to draw you back. God will speak to you and restore you. Sometimes he will send people to speak into your life. He might even be speaking to you right on this stream right now. You're watching from home, maybe thinking that you can't go back to church for whatever reason. God is willing to restore. First Peter 5 verse 10 says, And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. So the God who strengthened these people to build this wall and to build back the temple is able to build you. He's able to restore you, even though the walls that were keeping you secure in your salvation may seem like they've been broken down. God wants to, dis to restore you this morning. Psalm 71 verse 20 says, You who have made me see many troubles and calamities will revive me again. From the depths of the earth, you will bring me up again. You can't get to a place that's too low that God will not bring you out of. You can't go too far that God will not go and find you. Hallelujah. His spirit is with you wherever you are. So don't be discouraged. Don't feel like you've been counted out. God is able to restore. Just as he restored these walls, he can restore your life. Okay, so we're moving on quickly um, to the portion of scripture that was read, verses 27 to 47. But just before I go into that, you'll notice as we're reading through, and as I've made mention, David is mentioned very often in this chapter. And it's funny because David is never mentioned as being King David. His office of king, I don't believe, is mentioned at all during these, um, this chapter 12. But it speaks about David being a man of God. So even though he was a king, 
it says David, the man of God, a number of times. The greatest accolade, the greatest letter that we can have after our name or before our name is to be called a man or a woman or a child of God. That's the greatest um, demarcation anybody can put upon you. But it's got to come from God anyway. David was a man after God's own heart. He was that warrior, poet, that psalmist. He was multifaceted. He had numerous skills. But he was a gifted worshipper. Gifted worship leader. He wrote psalms and songs that we sing even today. And the Bible speaks about when David was bringing the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem in 1 Chronicles 16. And he led worship that day. And if you remember, he danced until his clothes fell off. He worshipped with exuberance because he knew what God had done. He knew God's power. He knew God's faithfulness. And he was filled with God's spirit and with joy. Can we say the same today? Can we worship with abandon like David? Can we lift up our hands and praise like nobody's there but just us and God? That's your cue. If that's you this morning, feel free in the house. God deserves all of our worship, all of our praise. Sometimes we're so reserved and we're so hemmed in and kept up. And if we're not careful, we'll be the Michael in the window. Say, look at this man, I was disgracing himself. But God doesn't want that for us. Not for us, the people of God. He wants us to worship him like we're the only one in the room. Yeah. It's funny, this morning I put some gospel music on and I was dancing in the front room. I won't tell you <laughs> too much. And the kids were telling me off, saying, turn it off, Dad. You're embarrassing us. <laughs> but you know what? I don't care. I'm going to praise God anyway. And you're going to have some praise parties of your own. Yeah? Somebody might be watching, somebody might not be watching. It's good if someone's watching. Praise God anyway. Let them know and see that there's something different about you. Let them get that fragrance, that sweet smelling savor of worship, pure worship unto our God. Just praise God anyhow. Remember what he's done for you. Remember what he's brought you from. David was in a cave on the run from Saul. He could have had his life taken at any time. He could have took Saul's life, but God delivered him. David had to live amongst his enemies and pretend he was mad, spit drooling down his beard. And yet, he God had brought into this place, to the highest office of the land, king. Of course he worshipped. But what has God done for you? Think about what God has brought you from. What God has brought you out of. Some of you are cancer survivors. Some of you shouldn't be here at all. Some of you probably should have died in a car wreck or something like that. I don't even know all of the things. But God, because of God's great faithfulness and love, you are here today to give him praise, to give him glory. This wasn't on the script, but just stand up. Just stand up and give God some praise in the house. There's enough to be scripted. Nobody has to tell you or pump you. Just think about his love. Think about his greatness and his goodness. Hallelujah. Lord, you're worthy. Hallelujah. We give glory and thanks unto your name, Lord God. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Worthy of all our praise. Worthy of glory. Worthy of honor. Majesty, dominion, and power be unto your name, Lord God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Let praises rise in this place. Let praise rise in your heart. Think about where God has brought you from. Think about where he's taking you to. Think about where you started. Hallelujah. And where we end in glory with him. Thank you, Jesus. 
thank you Jesus his mercy endures forever let us give thanks unto the Lord for he is good his mercy his goodness endures forever and ever his mercies are new every morning great is his faithfulness hallelujah thank you Jesus yes Lord hallelujah yes Lord remain in that attitude of worship and reflection and praise this morning the word says that we should give thanks according to the command of David so David set out the blueprint that these men so many years after were following so in first chronicles 16 it says that David appointed Asaph to lead worship Asaph and if you read through Psalms it often it says that some of the Psalms are written by Asaph or the sons of Asaph so Asaph was a priest but he was also a songwriter and a worshipper also and David appointed him and Obed Edom to lead two groups to lead praise on that day when he brought the ark back to Jerusalem and it's in the Psalms if we read through the Psalms we can see the great prophetic inspiration that David had which was expressed in musical worship you see David was a prophet you can look back at Psalms like Psalm 22 when it speaks about the crucifixion or Psalm 110 where it speaks about the verse that I just referenced about him being the high priest forever and there are others where David prophesied or prophesied through his worship and it wasn't just him there was Asaph and others check out the Psalms and at the top it will tell you who wrote each one so there was a prophetic dimension to his worship and I believe that when we worship God when we truly worship God in spirit and in truth there's something prophetic about it we're making prophetic declarations when we sing songs like behold he comes we're prophesying we're looking back at Jesus' first coming but we're looking forward to his second when he comes into Jerusalem riding on that cloud shining like the sun this is going to be our year of jubilee a year of freedom we're not just celebrating the queen and her jubilee god give thanks for her life but we're celebrating the freedom that we have in jesus christ who set us free from the bondage of sin and has allowed us to live life eternally with him in glory so david he initiated new songs of thanksgiving which he appointed to the priests and we go on and it speaks about the fact that David had put this into place and that into place and it's just amazing to me that hundreds of years after David set out these um, schedules of worship or methods of worship that they're being followed again who knows what you're going to put into place what disciplines that you're going to set out that somebody's going to be following years after should Jesus tarry you have a, we have a great responsibility to those that are coming after us those of us who have influence and leadership we are setting out patterns and and um, programs that people may follow long after we're gone and this is just mind-blowing to me that the fact that they're looking back to David for their inspiration on how they're going to give worship in their present day David gave a psalm of thanksgiving and I just want to read it and as I was kind of reading through it myself um, this psalm that he commissioned to be um, sung on the day that he brought the ark back to the covenant it's taken from Psalm 105 but it's also found in 1 Corinthians 16 and it says thus it's reading from verse 8 of um, 1 Corinthians 16 it says give thanks to the Lord 
Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the nations. We've got a responsibility to make God's deeds known among the nations. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wonders. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. That word rejoice, that's going to come up time and time again as if you read through Nehemiah 12. Be called upon to rejoice, to be joyful, to be filled with God's joy. Because when we're filled with joy, we can't be anxious or fretting or worrying or backbiting or pulling down anybody else. May we be filled with God's joy this morning and always. Going on, verse 11. Seek out the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. Remember the wonders he has done. I love that. Remember the wonders he has done. His marvels and the judgments he has pronounced. We were just doing that, weren't we? We were remembering Looking back at my life, I see all the wondrous things he's done for me. And therefore, I thank you, O Lord. Verse 13. O offspring of his servant Israel, O sons of Jacob, his chosen ones. He is the Lord. His judgments carry throughout the earth. He is the Lord our God and his judgments carry throughout the earth sometimes we need to remind ourselves of the fact that God is in control God is in charge and the reason why sometimes we get anxious and we get touchy and we start to fret and worry is because we lose sight of the fact that God is in control he's got it in his hand we don't have to worry about anything in fact the scripture tells us in Philippians 4 verses 6 to 7 not to be anxious about anything don't be anxious about anything but but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving make your requests to God before that in verse 4 it says rejoice in the Lord always and again I say rejoice but I just want to focus on a little bit here where it says don't be anxious about anything but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving with thanksgiving sometimes we're not great at giving thanks are we sometimes we take a lot of things for granted and we act like it's owed to us and you know God owes us a favor God doesn't owe us anything at all God owes you nothing at all nothing at all but through his grace he has blessed us through his grace we are here today he hasn't treated us in the way that we should have been treated but we're here in his house this morning to give him praise to glorify him and bless his name this scripture has been going on and on in my mind because I'm I've been conscious of the fact that sometimes I allow anxious worries to cloud my mind. But in focusing on that clause there with thanksgiving, it's enabled me to navigate some issues because when we give thanks to God, it changes our perspective. It changes the way that we think. It changes the way that we see things. You know, sometimes when we're being negative, all we can see is the negativity and everything. And that blocks our praise because we're moaning about the things that should be right and are not right. And I wish this one would get fixed and this part would be done and this and that and the other. But what about giving, what about turning that on its head? Give God thanks for what you have. Give God thanks for what is already in your possession. Give God thanks for life itself. After everything that we've just been through, surely every day that we get up and that we can breathe well and that we can go about our business and do our daily tasks, surely that is a reason for us to give God some praise. Hallelujah. 
give God thanks. And even if you're going through something tough, even though, even if life feels like it's turned and, and everything's getting rough, there's something, even if it's just the lifting up of the hands and just saying, God, I trust you in this. God, even though it feels like I can't see or feel you right now, I know, Lord God, that you're a deliverer. I know that you're a restorer. I know you to be a healer. Hallelujah. And I give you thanks and praise for all that you've done for me. Hallelujah. I'm not going to forget your benefits. Focus on those things that God has blessed you with and praise him in the midst of your storm. Praise him through your storm and you'll be praising him on the other side of it. Hallelujah. So we must praise with an attitude of gratitude. Worry and worship can't exist in the same place at the same time. If we declare that God is in control, that God is king of kings and is lord of all, then we shouldn't be worried about the sometimes the often very small things that cause us to lose sleep or cause us to think and to go over in our mind. God is in control. He's got it. I don't have to worry. All I've got to do is praise him and watch him work. Hallelujah. Praise God. So back to the text. Verse 27. It says that the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sought out the Levites in all their places to bring them to Jerusalem to celebrate the dedication, the dedication of the wall, with gladness. Both with thanksgiving and singing, with cymbals and stringed instruments and harps. So, note there, they were bringing up the Levites. The Levites don't have any kind of land of their own. They live amongst the people. Some of them live in the city. Some of them live in the villages and the towns outside. So there was a calling for the Levites, these priests who would offer up sacrifices to God, who would teach the people, but also who led worship. So they were called to come to Jerusalem to celebrate the dedication and they were instructed to come with gladness. <laughs> they were instructed to come with gladness. That's not, not often something that we instruct people to do nowadays, is it? Let we say come. But God doesn't want us to come any kind of a way before him. You know, in, in Nehemiah 1, when it speaks about the fact that he went before the king with a sad countenance, I believe we touched on this before, that in itself could have been a capital offence. To come before the king downhearted it's a, as if the king has done something to upset you or to cause you to be vexed. We to call before the, we call to come before God, the king upon the throne, the king of all that we can see, the king of the universe. We call to come before his presence with thanksgiving, with gladness. So before we come through the doors to worship, we should have a gladness check, right? We should have a joy check. Am I in the right frame of mind this morning? Is there something going on that's bothering me that I need to sort out before I come into his house? Do I need to apologize for some of my behavior? Do I need to reflect and, and just do a check on how I am? Am I feeling anxious? Am I feeling upset? Have I got anything against anybody that I need to just deal with right now before I go into worship? Let's come into his gladness. Let's resolve to come into his presence with gladness. Think about everything that he's done. Think about his goodness, his grace, his mercy. So they were instructed to celebrate with gladness, both with thanksgivings and singing. So this is one for me personally, <laughs> but it might be for you. Sometimes we sing and it's as if the word, we're singing the words just because we know the song. We, we're going through like muscle memory almost and we can switch off. But the word says that we should come with thanksgiving 
and singing. So come with your thanksgiving and singing. Have something in your heart that you're giving God thanks for. Know in your heart your why for worship. Know what your why is. Even if it's the fact that God has got me out of bed today, but I'm sure there's more. There's got to be more. Have in your heart your why. Come with gladness and thanksgiving in your heart. If we can come before an earthly king or queen with gladness, then we must be able to present ourselves before the king of kings and the lord of lords with a smile on our face because of his goodness and mercy. So they were instructed to come with their cymbals and stringed instruments and harps. So it wasn't always in the Bible that the um, praise would be accompanied with music. But on this special dedicated occasion, the um, Levites were instructed to bring their instruments. And that just made me think that God wants all of us. He's equipped us with gifts and with skills. We've got a wonderful band, haven't we? Skilled musicians who are at the top of their profession, their trade, in terms of musical accomplishments. But what if you can't play? What if, it's a, what if that is not your forte? What are you going to bring before him? What is your skill? What is your gift? All of us have got something. Everybody's got something. I was so encouraged last week to see Joel and his illustrations. I didn't know that Joel could draw like that. That in itself is a gift that we can bring to God. What about if you, maybe you can't sing? What, if, can you write poetry? Can you even just be an encourager? You know? It doesn't matter how small it might be in your eyes, but God wants all of you. He wants all of your gifts. He wants all of your talents. They're his. He gave them to you. Will you give them back to him? Will you offer them back to him? Let's see them. Because it's just so encouraging to everybody else when we see things like illustrations and art and poetry and all the many things, even people that are just great in business. Let's hear what God is doing in your life. See his inspiration at work in you, in the multifaceted ways in which he blesses each and every one of us. There's more than just what goes up on here on a Sunday morning. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Let that challenge you. Verse 28, it says, And the sons of the singers gathered together from the countryside around Jerusalem, from the villages of the Natufahites, from the house of Gilgal, and from the fields of Geba and Azmaveth. For the singers had built themselves villages all around Jerusalem. So these worship leaders, these Levites, they were on call, and they were ready to come when the call went out. So not just for the designated worshippers or worship leaders, but for all of us, are we on call and ready to come to worship when the call goes out? Sometimes we find any and every excuse not to take part, if we're honest. If we're honest. But let's be on call, ready to receive the word to come to worship. Let us run towards time of worship. And notice that sometimes when we're getting ready for Sunday worship, there's some people that are consistent in coming, and then sometimes it's a bit empty when we start. But let's turn that on its head. What if we're really enthusiastic about coming into the house of God to worship? Because sometimes, let's be honest, we're not that enthusiastic about it, are we? It's like we're coming to church because it's Sunday, and we know we've got to come, and yes, we believe, but we're not necessarily as enthusiastic as going to it as we might be, for example, to go and watch Liverpool play. <laughs> or to watch our favourite cricket team. Or, I don't know, to go and visit a friend that we haven't seen for a long time. Sometimes we have to check ourselves to say, where has that enthusiasm gone? And that even with that word, that enthusiasm, it's about God being part of us 
breathing into us, speaking into us. And on this day of Pentecost, can we check ourselves? Can we check our oil levels in this place? Do we need refilling? Do we need a top up of God's power in our lives? That fire to come into his presence with singing and to enter his courts with praise. Hallelujah. Praise God. Nehemiah 8 verse 10 that says that the joy of the Lord is the strength of the people. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Joy, biblical joy, is found in fellowship with God. Knowing who God is. Knowing what he's done. Knowing that he's faithful to his promises. It states in verse 29, it talks about the sons of the singers. And as I just said, um, it speaks about the sons of Asaph. And it continually refers back through the generations to those that have gone on before. So as I shared this morning, I was worshipping and my kids were telling me to to behave myself. (laughs) Lifestyles of worship can be passed down to our children and to those who are coming after us. You know, the way that we worship in this church... People are coming in who maybe don't even know God yet, but they're coming into a culture that we set the tone for. So if we are free in our worship, if we are unhindered and unchained and we're just free, then they will worship that way because that's what they will learn from us. So not just in our households, but in God's house, we set a tone for our worship. So we need to cultivate habits of praise and worship that are healthy that put God in his rightful place and that people that are coming after us can emulate verse 30 it says the priests and the Levites purified themselves and purified the people the gates and the wall so firstly the priests and Levites they purified themselves now through the scripture we'll know that this would have um, taken the um, this would have been ceremonial washings so they wash themselves in a certain way they keep themselves from certain things they wouldn't touch certain things they wouldn't do certain things but they would present themselves clean before God for worship so that's what they did in the Old Testament But in the New Testament, through the new covenant in Jesus, we cleanse ourselves. We don't cleanse ourselves outwardly, but we cleanse inwardly through confession of sin and repentance. We should be in the habit of confessing sin. Now, there's nothing that the enemy doesn't like more than when we have sin in our heart and we just ignore it and we push it to the side and we pretend like it's not there and just carry on as if there's nothing wrong that's the plan of the enemy to hide away those things that are done in the dark but leaders, these people, these Levites must be leaders leaders must be first in that process of purification and consecration and we have to create a space where everybody feels that they can unburden themselves of sin openly and without judgment because we've all sinned when I say without judgment obviously sin has consequences but we have to have a space where people can speak freely about their struggles so that they can come to a place where they can overcome sometimes we're very good at hiding aren't we hiding those things that we don't want people to see and oh I'm alright I'm you know brother so and so and reverend so and so but if we are honest with ourselves we slip we fall we make mistakes but there should be no hindrance to us coming to God and saying God I've sinned have mercy on me cleanse me from my unrighteousness we must be um, ready and willing to confess unrepentant sin quickly and have a discipline of doing so Um, Psalm 66 verse 18 is that familiar 
phrase, that familiar scripture, if I regard iniquity in my heart, if I know that sin is in my heart and I don't do anything about it, the Lord will not hear me. Now when I have read that in the past, I've always thought about that being in terms of prayer. But I believe it applies to our worship as well, our praise. The Lord is not going to hear us if we look at sin in our heart. We know that it's there and we just carry on regardless. God wants holiness and purity. Amen? Hallelujah. Verse 31 says, So I brought the leaders of Judah up onto the wall, and I appointed two large thanksgiving choirs. So this is Nehemiah. This is him following after the um, prescription by David as to how um, this procession would go. So there are two teams, two thanksgiving choirs, two groups that are led by the leaders, the priests, and the Levites. So it said, one went to the right hand on the wall towards the refuse gate. And um, there's a little ask, there's a schematic that I found online. I know that the text is very small. Please don't try and read the text when the image goes up. But it will show you the course that the two groups took. Yes, so Sister Margaret, if you can put that on the screen. So there were two choirs. Now that's very small. You're not going to be saying, I would see the writing necessarily. Some of you who got keener sight might be able to. But those two lines represent the two choir groups. So they both start at the dung gate or the refuse gate. And as you can see, the city is set on a hill. And the temple mount is at the very top of the hill. So they start at the dung gate and they make their procession up the two sides of the wall as they go up towards the high place, the temple on Temple Mount. So we remember as we um, studied in previous weeks in chapter 4, verse 1 to 3 of chapter 4, it reads this. But when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became furious completely enraged and he ridiculed the Jews. He spoke before his brothers and the army of Samaria, what are these feeble Jews doing? Can they restore it for themselves? Can they offer sacrifices? Can they finish it in a day? Can they revive the stones from the heaps of dust and rubbish, even the ones that have been burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him and he said, even what they are building. If a fox should get up on it, he would break down their stone wall. So the detractors and the haters of what Nehemiah was doing and the people were doing were saying that even if a fox was to climb up on the wall and stand up, the wall would fall down. But here we've got two choirs marching the full length of the wall to the temple with praise, with music and singing. Sometimes our praise is an act of defiance. It's, it's a shout that will cause your enemy to be ashamed of what he has tried to do. It's important that sometimes, you know, we, we stay in these four walls sometimes and we love the comfort of being in the house, but sometimes we have to go out. Sometimes we have to allow the community and even those who are our detractors to see the fact that no matter what the enemy is trying to do, God is in the midst and we're not going to be moved. We're going to continue to worship. The enemy can throw his best at us and he might have even tried to do that already. But let praise and worship be what we are known for. God is in control. He already established his will. He already has spoken the word that his people would come back. He spoke to Jeremiah. He spoke to Daniel already. And he's accomplishing his work through the work of Nehemiah and um, Zerubbabel who went before. God's will and purposes are established and will be accomplished 
on the earth. And this is the bedrock of worship. The consistent choice to place God at the highest place. Note that they were going up the hill to the highest place. They were going to the highest place. We've got to put God in that place in our lives. It's not just about us doing the performative things and the outward things. It's an inward work. Amen? Hallelujah. This wall wasn't built just by the work of human hands, but by God. The fact that they managed to do all of that, that well, when you see the image, all of that in 52 days. 52 days. You know, some of us have probably got extensions on our house that might have taken longer than that. <laughs> Let alone a wall around the city. 52 days. God's hand was in it. Sometimes the things that we do in this house, the disciplines that God has us observe, sometimes they're not very visible. But this wall was visible. And on this day of dedication, the worship and the praise was very visible. We shouldn't always hide and cower in fear. We've been empowered by God's Spirit to worship Him openly and in the confidence that God is our Lord and that He is greatly to be praised. Verse 43, it says, Also that day they offered great sacrifices and rejoiced, that word again, rejoice, for God had made them rejoice with great joy. The women and the children also rejoiced, so that the joy of Jerusalem was heard afar off. When was the last time anybody heard your joy? When was the last time anybody heard your joy? I'm not talking about in church. I'm talking about outside. There's people outside of this place, people who you may interact with on a daily basis that have seen the grumpy and the frowny version of Adrian. They've seen when I haven't had my cup of coffee in the morning. But what about the joy? What about the joy that comes from God living in my heart? The fact that I know him, the fact that I know that my future is assured in him. Do people see that in you? Do people know that of you? When was the last time anybody saw your joy? And sometimes when we're going through situations, that is the most opportune time for us to declare the fact that God is in control and that we are his children and he wants the best for us. Many of us, we work in environments where the way that people kind of let off steam is to go and get drunk or go and intoxicate themselves in order to escape the, the hardships of life or the ups and downs of life. But in Ephesians 5, verses 18 to 21, it says, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is wickedness. This is from Amplified. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is wickedness, corruption, stupidity. We know it's stupid, right, to get drunk. We should know. It's silly. But be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit and constantly guided by him speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs offering praise by singing and making melody with your heart to the lord always giving thanks to god the father for all things always giving thanks to god the father for all things in the name of our lord jesus christ being subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. So our lives should be marked by praise, by worship, by songs, singing and making melody in our heart to the Lord. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you're always going to be cheery, happy, fake, you know, the kind of fake smile, but a deep seated joy in our hearts that cannot be shaken that no matter what circumstance we might face people can look at you and say there's something different about you there's some treasure in that earthen vessel there's something inside of you that no matter what life throws at you you've got that deep seated joy that that anchoring joy 
that comes from knowing Jesus. Hallelujah. That ability to withstand the trials and the tests of life because that spirit of God rests upon you and is in you. So we all, that verse that I read from verse 43, we all have a part to play. Not just the leaders, not just the worship leaders. It spoke about the women and the children. At that time, they wouldn't have been involved in worship, but let's just broaden that out. Everybody who's not involved in a leadership position. We all have a responsibility to praise the Lord. Don't just rely on people who have got a designated title and who are up here. And if we're leading, we have to bear that in mind. Our worship shouldn't just be about us up here and everybody down there just spectating and watching. Don't be a spectator. Get involved. Open your mouths, lift your hands, lift your voice and sing. God wants to hear your praise. God wants to hear your praise. If the Levites and the leaders had sung by themselves, maybe that praise wouldn't have been heard so far. But it was because everybody came together. Everybody in one accord, lifting up voices of praise to God. The word says that they were heard afar off. Those people who wanted to stop the work heard the praise. Those people who were happy about it heard the praise. News would have gone out throughout all of the Persian lands, the lands of those people who um, were occupying the nation. They would have heard about this praise party. So we have an obligation to rejoice, to worship exuberantly. To worship not just within the four walls. To worship not just on a Sunday. Let somebody else see what God is doing in your life. Let your joy, the joy that comes from the Lord, spur you on in worship. Hallelujah. Don't just spectate, but participate. Don't just spectate. You must participate. The word says that everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Do you have breath? Do you have breath? Yes. Then let's praise the Lord. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. If you can breathe. There's a song that came out recently that says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. For this is why we have breath. To praise the Lord. Hallelujah. That's the reason we have breath. To praise the Lord. And in conclusion, these last few verses, it speaks about service at the temple. And what it speaks about is the fact that the people who are so moved by the worship, it speaks about their contributions, their gifts, their tithes, their offerings. It says in verse 44, on that day men were appointed. So there were Levites that were appointed over the storerooms, the contributions, the first fruits and the tithes to gather them into the portions required by the law for the priests and for the Levites according to the fields of the towns and then it goes on to say for Judah rejoiced over the priests and the Levites who ministered so the people were willing to give because they were filled with joy at the, the ministry they were receiving from the ministry and they were happy to give back to the works of the Lord and we see a beautiful relationship a beautiful order take place in those verses where the people are so moved by the ministry of the leadership that they are happy to give into the, the, the ministry people sow into ministry when they can see God's hand at work when they can see God's sovereignty through the ministry of leadership and God provides for his people when we give cheerfully. When we give, God provides, doesn't he? Yeah. I'm a testament to the fact that God has provided. Hallelujah. And so in a healthy relationship, in a healthy 
church relationship when we are receiving I and mean, when we can see God's hand at work that will inspire us to worship not only in our praise but also in our giving when we can see God's hand at work in the life of the church so we need to get that balance right so in conclusion now is the time to worship as we praise we declare that God is great and is to be praised greatly let's not praise him out of our reserve let's not praise him out of what we're comfortable to give but praise him with all that we have all that we are as we praise we surrender all of our heart our soul our mind and our strength to the lord our creator and our sustainer as we praise god we remember all of god's goodness to us and as um, I reflect back on the singers climbed, uh, um, walking up the wall they start at the dung gate think about where you started off think about the state of sin that we were in and where we would be without God in our lives but he is calling us up to his holy place calling us up to his presence hallelujah remember God's goodness as we praise we take our focus off our inability to control situations and seasons but we put our wholehearted trust in the hands of an almighty God hallelujah as we praise we declare to a dying world that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father on this day of Pentecost this our jubilee let us give God his due praise. He's worthy, amen? Yes. Your victory is bound up in your praise. Let us worship God together. Hallelujah. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. As I finish, I don't know if there's anybody in the house or maybe even on the stream who doesn't know Jesus, who hasn't accepted him into their heart, who does not know of this joy that we speak of. If that is you, now is the time. The altar is open. And if you're in the house today, you don't know Jesus. Jesus who came, lived a perfect life, died for our sin and our shame but rose from the grave hallelujah and is now seated at the right hand of the father making intercession for us if you don't know him or maybe you feel that you've strayed far from him now is the time to come forward now is the time if you're on the stream you don't have to come be here physically make an altar right where you are and let's pray together I'm going to pray for you hallelujah hallelujah lord god giver of good gifts creator and sustainer hallelujah restorer lord we give you thanks today we thank you lord god that you've taken lives lord god that were on the rubbish heap lives that were broken down and destroyed lord god and you've made something beautiful out of us through your great love and Lord God, I pray, Lord God, for those, Lord, who do not know you. Lord God, maybe somebody on this stream, hallelujah, who right now is pouring out their heart to you. Lord God, I know that you can see them. Lord God, I know that you know them. You know their name. Lord Jesus, and I just ask, Lord God, hallelujah, that you come into their heart in a real way. May they feel your love, your joy your peace even where they are right now meet them at the point of their need right now 
Hallelujah. May they experience your joy even for the first time as they confess their sins to you and as they invite you, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, unto the throne of their heart. Lord God, I pray that you'd fill us with joy. Fill us with gladness. Fill us, Lord God, hallelujah, with the evidence of your spirit at work in our lives. Hallelujah, that those, Lord God, who are afar off, hallelujah, the humble, Lord God, shall hear and be glad. Those, Lord God, who may be distant from us, may they be drawn close to you this morning. We give you thanks and we give you praise for all that you've done for us. In Jesus' precious holy name.